Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money in the Investing Show. This week we are looking at mastering financial advice for young adults. This is such an important step because if you can build momentum early and do things right, learn it once, do it right, live off it forever is very much what our philosophy is. We'll go through some practicalities here and some tips on where to focus your time right now to really help you get on track. As always, make sure you take plenty of notes, but most importantly, make sure you take plenty of action. Hey guys, welcome to this week's Money in Investing Show with me, your host, Andrew Baxter, and as always, my offsider and co-host, Mitchell Rentschel. Good to be here, Mr. B. Thank you very much. Now, we're going to get a little nitty-gritty today, and specifically targeting this episode to the young adults out there. We're going to specifically... All right, well, okay, let's... let's yeah, I can see you posing what, a question. What, what is a young adult? What's the definition well, of a young I think, adult? So you think, I think adult can be a really loose term because there's people who are adults when they're 15, and there's people who are still kids when they're 40. So let's just put some ranges on this and say anywhere between say 18 and 35 I okay would say. yeah that's fair enough i was going to say i mean my daughter's gonna be 10 at the next birthday and she's almost like a young adult sometimes so okay yeah very nice well we're going to talk about mastering the element of personal finance ultimately any investing journey and wealth creation journey starts with the basics so let's get stuck into it Excellent stuff, and I, I guess you know the, the, an apathy about finance can can be very easy to fall into when we're young because you think I've got a whole lifetime ahead of me of doing stuff. What we don't recognise is that time goes by pretty damn quick, and, and the sooner you get started, as you know yourself, you know the sooner you can get the job done. And it might seem, oh, that's all very poindexter and very boring to sort of focus in on this. I just want to live my life and get out there and party and have a good time. You can do both. Um, but the quicker you get the job done, or at least get some momentum into that, um, the better for sure. That's right. And I think having expectations of what's achievable and then what takes a little bit more time to get to is important. But if we get stuck into the essentials of personal finance, AB, what would we deem these as? Look, you've got to start with what, what do you actually want out of life, your goals. And we're not going to go into a big goal setting session. We've done that so many times through this series. Um, but you've got to have some level of clarity as to what you want. For some people, you know, a life of um, financial abundance is something that's very, very important to them. Others uh, are less motivated by that and they just want to have an experience through life as well. Um, you know, live hard, die young um, and, and so on and so forth. So you've got to have a level of clarity. Uh, of, of what you want as a starting point. And then second to that is, well, okay, if you've worked out what it is that you want, how am I going to get there? And as always, it comes back to one simple thing, and that's budgeting. Budgeting. So saving the money first and then not spending it all, right? I think budgeting is knowing where your money goes uh, because it's one of those things that can be such a leaky bathtub for people. Um, whereby, okay, you've got an idea of what your income is. If you're on a salary uh, or a wage, you know what's coming in every week. Uh, and the question is, where does it go? And the idea of a budget is it gives you a very clear and transparent way of seeing where that money goes out the door. The reason you want to know that is that there may be areas where it's going out the door where you want to stop that. Um, some things you don't get a choice of, of course, uh, and others where you might want to um, you know, increase where that money goes. So, for example, um, you know, when you start to sit down and, and look on a weekly and a monthly basis, now this sounds really granular, but it's, it's world-class basics like this, which really helps set you up for the next few things within the, within the, the game plan. So let's just say you've got a, a series of subscriptions. So it could be streaming TV, uh, it could be gym membership that maybe you don't use anymore, a magazine that you don't pick up, uh, maybe you're on Audible, uh, picking up your audiobooks, whatever it may be. If it's a service you're not using, cut it because you know a dollar saved is a dollar you've then got to invest. It's very, very important to have that mindset. And budgeting is not about being punitive and cutting out all the colour in life. It's actually making everything you want in life possible. you just got to accept that there's a level of delayed gratification in order to have that. So starting off with a budget and being very honest with that budget. And look, if you've got a, uh, a weekend um, activity that you like getting involved with it could be you know you like going to the tab or it might be like going out clubbing whatever it might be there's nothing wrong with any of those things if you budget for it that's and right. stay within that budget so that's that's probably the, the 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 major crux of it and then once you've got that budget in play it's going to enable you to save because if you want to succeed as an investor uh, if you want to succeed in business 
you got to spend less than what you earn. It's as simple as that. And that surplus, that saving, gives you the investment capital to then move into um, getting your asset base grown. So savings, and, and, and when we talk about savings, having that emergency fund. So you've got a one month of expenditure covered, should you lose your job, for example, uh, that you've got that in reserve. And in fact, I like to stretch that a little bit for people. And once they've got one month of emergency fund, actually grow it to three months. And that gives you a lot more peace of mind and stability. But the other thing it does, Mitch, is it, it, it gives you that muscle memory of learning how to save and, and, and the recognition that it takes you out of being in a position of being, say, week to week, where you start to get a lot less financial stress in your life and, and, and maybe a few choices. So budgeting first, uh, then getting stuck into uh, your emergency funds and your saving. I think as you're doing that, you've got to target any bad debt that you might have lying around too. Yes. And it's so, so easy, especially for younger people to get caught in that. Well, I mean, you think about how available it is to afterpay or use a credit card yeah. now. They're pretty easy to get, but we know that kind of bad debt has not just an effect on your budget if you're paying interest and you're not paying it off in full, but also your credit score and your ability to get a mortgage and that kind of thing later down the track. Exactly right. There are ramifications. And you know, buy now, pay later, I think is, is in, in my opinion at least, is, is, is predatory lending. Uh, and, and we've started to see the wheels come off that in terms of you know, genuinely a lot of people finding themselves in financial difficulty because of, of, of the ease of that money. So getting rid of bad debt like that, uh, getting your credit card debt paid off is, is essential because, again, if you're only paying minimums, the interest rate on it is really punitive and you're just not going to get ahead. You're just treading water if not drifting backwards in the current. Can I ask you a question? Mm. So I've heard some mixed advice around credit cards and some people see it as a really great tool, others see it as the evil. Now, I, a source, a fairly prominent source in my life has said get yourself a credit card because it's a good way to improve your credit score assuming mm -hmm. that you pay it off in full every month that obviously comes with a level of discipline what are your thoughts on young people getting credit cards to actually achieve that yeah that's a that's a really interesting one i remember probably in my late teens early 20s my girlfriend who was from quite a, a wealthy family at the time uh said you know you should have a credit card to get your points and all this sort of stuff and it's like, oh, you got to pay cash for everything, working class, blah, 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 as it was at the time. And, 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 and it was a revelation. Uh, and I've, I've certainly had a credit card since then, and I've been resolute on making sure that it's paid off in full each month. And, yeah, I'm, I'm a big, big fan of, of credit cards. You know, I, I, I spend a lot on them. Um, I think there are some benefits if you've got the discipline with that. Um, there's also things like insurance that come with your card too, which can be quite handy. Um, and for me, I love the points because, you know, I like taking my family around the world and, you know, Get a get you use your points for that is not a bad idea, especially with American Express. So, no, I'm a huge advocate, but it comes, it's an earned right. Let's let's put it that way. You can't just here's a credit card off you go. You've got to demonstrate, as you rightly say, that ability to to be able to pay it off each month on time, because then it's not going to be detrimental to your credit score for one. And number two, again, it's it, it's. It's, it's a commercially incentivized way of using money because you've had the benefit of the money today, but you're not actually physically paying for it for, let's say, 45 days. So it's almost a, an interest-free loan in that respect, which makes all, a, a lot of sense if you've got the discipline to pay it off. So credit cards provided, little asterisk, little star there, provided you've earned the right to use it, you've got good spending habits. If you someone that's built up a credit card balance you got to stop using it. Yeah, Simple absolutely. Get rid of that day. So it's, a, it's, a, it's, 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 an, it's, it's an awful thing. And be smart about which one you pick too because there's no point having an American Express Platinum if you are only spending minimal amount each month, right? Because mm. those annual fees can up pretty, add up pretty quick. Mm, absolutely. Speaking of which, if we then get into the whole notion of investing, so mm. we've got saving, budgeting, and then saving to invest. Now, for a lot of young people out there, that can be tough and daunting because they might think, well, I don't really have a lot of money to invest. I've only just started my journey. Mm. What vehicles would you suggest? I think that climbing the mountain of investing, particularly if you're starting behind the eight ball where you haven't had good financial habits, you haven't got a budget, maybe you've got some lingering debt, those sorts of things, it can seem like an insurmountable mountain to have to try and climb. Uh, and I think it's one of those things that you've just simply got to get started. And the earlier you get started and the quicker you get started, the easier it becomes because you do build up momentum. So if you've gone through the previous steps where you've budgeted, you've got your emergency fund set up, you've got your bad debt, the next thing to do with that surplus cash flow, because you have surplus cash flow if you've paid your debt down and you've been able to um, to build up a war chest, is to start investing. You say, well, what's the point? It's only $100 here or there. But when you look at... Yeah, you know, there's some other companies like Raise and Starship, and I know they've come in for their fair, fair bit of hassle. 
Um, they're absolutely fantastic at helping people with you know, relatively small amounts of money get started, saving the change from a, you know, like a $5.80 transaction, that 20 cents kicks into your account to, to gradually build up. And it sounds like it's nothing, but over time it really does accumulate. When you start to see results from that, it can give you a bit of a, I suppose, a renewed vigor uh, for wanting to save more. So I'm a huge fan for that microinvesting. Um, you know, a regular savings account of cash. Yeah, with inflation, particularly where it is as we're recording today, where interest and, and where interest rates are relative to each other, I think you've got to get money working harder than that. I'll just whack it into an ETF, an exchange traded fund index tracker, so that you've got your money actually physically working. You've got an emergency fund if you need it, you've got that covered, you've got a credit card that you're paying off each month, and just putting that extra surplus into an ETF index tracker is a really light way of getting started. The key thing is is making sure it's 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 away from your current account, whatever you do with it. If you start to save cash to buy a house, for example, you've got to put that in a separate account from, from, from where you're doing your daily banking so you can't see that money, you're not tempted to use it then and it's going to be able to then you know, acc- accumulate in order for you to, to do your next level. So thoughts on this, AB, if I can, from you. Uh, I've heard a lot of people say, okay, if your intention is to buy a house within the next two years, mm. don't invest it into the stock market because we know markets can be volatile, keep it in the bank. If there's any longer time frame than two years, then you can invest that money, but make sure you're able to then access it to invest to buy a house. What are your thoughts on that t- sort of time frame as a suggested? Yeah, I think it's a very peculiar um, time frame to suggest to someone because you can say, look, if you t- time horizon is more than two years, then it's you know it, it's, it's okay. It took the stock market 12 years to recover from the GFC. So two years is is, is a, a particularly bizarre time frame. If you're comfortable having a level of risk, and when you're younger, you have to accept that to get ahead, you have to take some level of risk, it's probably the way to go. You can't save your way to wealth. You have to get that money growing. And let's face it, if you're earning 5% on your cash, which are, uh, you know, in a property market that's moving at 7% a year, it doesn't matter what you save, you're not going to get there. Yep. So you have to be looking at something outside of that, but you then have to accept the fact that it does come potentially with a level of risk. So by taking some small steps to understand what you're doing with your investing to reduce risk in that space, understand a bit more about risk management, all the stuff that we teach our clients, I think you can dip a toe into the market with a little bit more confidence than that. You know, let's face it, if you, if you, if you had you know, every year you were managing to save ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 and you've been whacking that into NVIDIA each year, I'd say you'd be buying your house oh, yeah. already as opposed to somebody that's just putting more money in the piggy bank hoping it's going to get them to a deposit level, which it just simply won't. Absolutely. Now, a term you've mentioned a couple of times is inflation. Mm. And this convers- t- topic of conversation is very prudent, particularly during times of high inflation, and that's student debt. Mm. So young listeners out there, you just finished uni or maybe a TAFE course or whatever it is, and you've got some debt that you need to pay back. Mm. Now, there's a few different ways to play this. But as we know, with student debt, I can say from my experience, it's all indexed to inflation. So during times of really low inflation, it's almost an interest-free loan. Mm -hmm. And if the cash that you've got in the bank or that you're using to invest can earn a greater greater rate of return than the inflation rate, i.e. the interest rate on your student debt, then there's a comparative advantage. That's a little harder at the moment, though, with inflation at 7 or 8%. Look, it, it does, I mean, and it's, if you look at the debt that you focus on paying off, if, you, if you've got credit card debt at 19% versus you know, personal loan at, say, 9 it makes more sense to target the credit card debt at that point in time. Um, in, in this instance, exactly the same. So if inflation is picking up and your cost of your student, student loan has increased, then chip away at it for sure. Do you want to use the cash that you've been saving to do that? Probably not, because it's always hard paying for something after after the event. I guess that's why you know when you do most things, there's an admission fee. You think about going to a theme park, um, you know, you're going to go to SeaWorld, and they say it's 95 bucks to come in. You go, okay, you pay it on the way in. If they left it till you were leaving and said, okay, it's time to pay, how much do you want to pay? It wouldn't be $95 no. because you just wouldn't see the value in it. And so after you've been at uni and you've got your qualifications, you're paying after the fact. So it's not a pleasant thing to have to pay for. There's no positive assumption with it. So rather than use your money uh, uh, or or, or savings, I'd suggest that you get a side hustle working. And maybe your goal from that side hustle, uh, and again, it comes back to to, the goal side of things, is to very, very specifically use the income from that side hustle to eliminate the student loan. Uh, And then when that's done, keep that side hustle going 
you've already seen a result of getting rid of some debt and the next thing is to use that side hustle income as a turbo charge for your savings for you know potentially your property deposit for example gotcha and but you've you've you is a bit of a poison chalice insofar as you've you've got rid of some pain being the debt and they've got the pleasure of the property to come from it and it's a good incentive to keep using that side hustle for it and and a lot of people these days are open to side hustles which is good uh, and a lot of people fold their arms and go i'm too busy i don't have the time you have to. It's not a, a second or third form of income these days. is not a luxury. It's a, it's a necessity, both with the cost of living, you know, instability in job markets, uh, where the economy is and potentially going right now. You have to have that second form of income, and I think a side hustle is a great thing. So yeah, use that to get your debt down. So it's not not the money you're working hard on the other side of the ledger to start to accumulate. Find another source of income, get that debt eliminated, and then once that's done, use that as a turbocharge for the other side. It makes perfect sense. That said, I mean if you can employ structuring, um, which obviously some people do, um, to avoid the, the need to pay that student debt off for as long as possible, then that makes sense too. Uh, and getting good advice on that uh, is key. A lot of people won't understand what I mean, but is it 50, if you earn more than 50? Yeah, I think like if you're an employee grand? and it's 55 grand or more that you earn per year, mm-hmm. then you are obligated to start chipping away mm-hmm. at that. But if you're structured in the right way and you don't necessarily earn 55,000 in your personal name, yep. then you... So take- if you're a contractor, for example, and you're earning on a an ABN, um, you, you could be earning, let's say, 100 grand a year, but what you actually pay yourself in your own name might be substantially less than that, which it probably should be. Yep. Uh, in which case, you'd then avoid the need to repay that loan. And there'll be people that hear this and go, oh, "That's not fair. That's just the rule book as it stands. You know, just got to play th- the rules." Yeah, I think it's smart too because mm. if you can retain cash in your business, for example, and you can invest that, and let's mm. say you earn seven percent or six percent even mm. per year on an investment called property or shares, mm. whichever one, but you're uh, inflate your interest rate on your student loans only three percent then you've got a four percent marginal benefit mm. it's really smart and that accumulates over time especially as if you're a young adult you've effectively got a whole adult lifetime ahead of you to to reap the benefits of that that's right now, speaking of structuring let's mm. come to the final part of our episode today and that's the role of financial planning mm. now a lot of young people would think well i'm only just starting why would i care about financial planning yep. is that necessarily the case the case Look, financial planning um, doesn't come with the the most illustrious of perception right now, and rightly so. I mean, the Royal Commission exposed it for what it was, which fee for no service and and, and the various uh, elements of skullduggery that were going on, and to an extent still are going on out there, ripping consumers. So I can understand why there's quite the, the resistance on the part of younger people. And secondly... And this is horrific, and I read this a little while ago. One of the big dealer groups, they said, like, if you've got less than a million bucks, don't come and talk to us. It's not cost-effective for us to, to give you advice. In other words, our fees are very heavy. Now you think about that, that's such a negative message to pass out to people that are looking for help. And I've always been of the view that you know, if someone's seeking help, you've got to provide them uh, with something. Uh, and so I don't think the traditional financial planning route is suitable for young adults. In fact, I think looking at the traditional financial planning route in Australia... I don't really think it's suitable for anybody because it's 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 been demonstrably shown for what it is, uh, which is you know a, a lack of value add, uh, and people can do a lot better. And I guess that's one of the reasons um, that we wrote the Wealth Playbook. You know, the idea would be that you could pick up a book uh, off the shelf that you can read in a week that's going to give you the benefit of a lifetime of financial planning advice, particularly when you pair it with a learning portal, where you can pick it up wherever you are in the journey, see what you need, and more importantly, understand why you need it. So you're getting educated along the way rather than being sold at uh, by by um, by a traditional sort of financial planner within a dealer group. Uh, and, and you can then build the tools out to suit what the journey needs to look like for you, whether that's a portfolio of ETFs, whether it's a uh, investment in the property market, whether it's structuring, all of that stuff really being laid out. But I don't think people really appreciate the value of financial planning in advance. I think you look at it back retrospectively and go, you know, getting that structuring advice to do it this way made a lot of sense. At the time, it just seemed like I was paying a fee for, for nothing, but I kind of understand why I need it now. So it does play a role. And, and, and the reason why is your life is very dynamic. You might have this goal that, let's say you want to be a millionaire, you want to have two properties and uh, and some passive income to, to, to help you on your way to retirement. Well, how do you get there from where you start today? And, and then what are some of the modifications that are going to be needed to your plan along the way? So, for example, as a young adult, um, you might be buying your first property. You might also be getting married. You might be starting a family, um, which puts a really different dynamic because 
there's probably one income earner if you're having a family, not two. Uh, and then you, if you're someone that's married and you've got a couple of kids, your ability to borrow changes, in which case you have to be more strategic in the way that you approach things and structuring and all those different things in order to keep you on track for that. And good advice can actually be quite helpful along the way, but you, you end up paying for it. And I think the Wealth Playbook is a great way of getting the benefit of understanding what the game plan looks like without getting touched up for some fairly heavy fees. Indeed. And where can our listeners find that, AB? Uh, any any of the normal bookstores, Booktopia, Amazon, you know, Barnes Noble, um, you know, QBD, just about everyone's got it. Um, Pretty cool, isn't it? it? It's great. It's been selling well. The feedback's been great. And, uh, yeah, the wealthplaybook.com.au, if you want to order your copy, you can get on there uh, and order a copy too. And it's going to give you, in black and white, as I say, something that's jargon-free, very approachable, very practical. Uh, and I think that's very important for young people. You know, without being ageist, younger people have got a pretty thin tolerance for fluff. So you've got to get to the point. And you've got to get to the point in a way that's reasonably easy to understand. If you've got something that's written in code or jargon, it's very fluffy, it's not going to make the cut. And the way that book's been structured is very much targeted to help people get the information they need you know, early, quickly, accurately uh, and transparently without all the fluff and mumbo jumbo that goes alongside it. Yep. Very nice. AB, mastering the art of personal finance for our younger listeners out there. Perfect. Thank you very much. My pleasure, Mitch. Anytime. There you have it, guys. Make sure you like, comment, subscribe. Most importantly, hit the notification button. And we'll look forward to hosting you next week.